We've got to live in this world. If we can't live in this world with the sinners and the things that's going on in this world, Jesus would have snatched us out. And I think at times I would have been so much better off after the day I was baptized at nine if God had come down and reached his hand down and taken me to heaven. This is a question I have been pondering for most of the day as I've looked into our notes tonight. And I think this is a very, very eye-opening question. And here's the question, and I want you to ponder it for yourself. Do you find it easier to love people or to hate people? Do you find it easier? And I'm going to take this next step because the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. Do you find it easier to love people or be indifferent to people? And the reason why I want you to think about that is we have a command and that command is that we need to not just love one another but we need to show christ's love to the world and it is very much easier i think for most of us to be indifferent towards others and i'm not condemning anybody i know from my personal experience it's easier for me to be indifferent it's much easier for me to go through the world and act like other people don't matter. It's much easier for me to ignore people, especially if they don't look like me and they don't act like me and they don't smell like me. Right? It's so much easier. And I'm here to tell you that what the parable that we are going to be talking about that we talked about a little bit last week is we have a responsibility to the world, not just us. Comments before we get into the lesson. On these parables, uh, Diane just brought it up, and I think I agree with her that the wheat and the, and the uh, tares or the weeds is primarily uh, a judgment within the church, is it not? That anybody who is not in the church is, is uh, already judged themselves, so to speak. Well, we're going to look at that tonight. Very good. But I disagree. I think it has to do with everybody. Okay? Well, it, I, it, it does, but I, I think there is a specific application within the church. Well, there's an application in the world and in the church. We're going to get to all that tonight. So instead of jumping in and answering that question, I just want you to know. Yes, Jan. I completely agree with you about the indifference thing. And I think... You're not indifferent to it? Uh, I could be, but really I don't care. Uh, it's... You know, it's so easy because we get so self-absorbed. Uh, we get consumed with being to this place or that place on time. Or the person who maybe has a real emergency, maybe has something really bad going on, who cuts us off in traffic or takes 12 items in the 10 item line or any number of things like that we can get we can wrap ourselves around the axle over things that really don't matter and yet be totally blind to the things that do amen amen and and i'm going to tell you this is something i wrestle with constantly I, I saw a t-shirt the other day, and I wanted to buy it and wear it to church. And the t-shirt says, on the outside, I may look kind and nice, but on the inside, I've already slapped you three times. <laughs> wow. Because that's what I do. I mean, I literally do that. I stuff it. 
We got we had these guys working. At, we had to replace our driveway. We got these guys putting in pavers. And I mean, I want to go out there and grab the pavers and show them how to do it because it's taking them so long. And every time they get started good, they leave. I'm like, where are you guys going? And I kid you not, they've been working since last Tuesday. So it's over a week now they were working. They told me they might finish it today. But up until today, they didn't even claim to speak English. I kid you not. I come out every morning. Good morning. How's it going? <laughs> oh, man. That was John Shackelford said that. Yes, Chris. Oh, hold on Chris. a minute. He's going to get a mic right, to let you. Let me come around. <laughs> let, let him run around. I only let Jason do this because he needs the exercise. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it always comes down to definitions. And, and I think if you look in the dictionary, the, the opposite of love is hate, not, not indifference. Um, but I do think that, that obviously God hates indifference. He hates lukewarm. You can look in the early uh, revelations and, and, you know, those who weren't passionate. You know, I don't think when you want to, or, or at least the T-shirt says slap, that's not indifference. No. That, that's just covering up what you really want to do, right. which is not what you want to do. It's, but, it's, but my point is not my indifference, it's my lack of love. Well, absolutely. absolutely. And I have to work at being loving because it's not in my nature. And, and the opposite of love and I'll tell you this from many years of marriage counseling. You get two people in a room that are fighting with each other, as long as that one of them hates the other and back and forth, you can put that marriage back together. But when one of them becomes indifferent towards the other and they could care less what the other does, you're never going to put that marriage back together. That's the opposite of love. That's that indifference. And that's the reason why I say that. And it may very well be in the dictionary that love is the opposite of hate, but I'm telling you in real life experience, the opposite of love in a marriage is indifference. So, the reason why I started all of this out with that question is because no matter how much we study God's word and we get these parables down, if we don't start applying things to our life, we have become hearers of the word only. And I think that is the saddest scripture in James where people just hear the word and they walk away as though somebody looked in the mirror and forgot what they saw. This evening we're at dinner and uh, I was uh, trying to help my arteries by putting butter on a piece of bread. And I got a little bit too much butter on my bread. And I had a piece of butter on my lip right there. Sandy saw it, but she refused to say anything. What? <laughs> but Linda cares enough about me that she goes. <laughs> Good job, Linda. <laughs> yeah. Sandy is indifferent. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. All right. So last week, we, we talked about parables. They illustrate truth about the kingdom of God. They aren't allegories. That means they stand alone. One thing doesn't mean this for every little thing in it. They have um, a primary purpose of them is for them to conceal and reveal. They're going to conceal truth to those who are not a part of God's kingdom. They're going to reveal truth to those who are a part of God's kingdom. So... Let's go back over this scripture again. Uh, John, you did such a great job of reading it last time around. Would you mind reading it again? Uh, verses 24 through 46, please, sir. Is that Matthew 13? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Matthew 13, 24 through 36. Uh, through 46, 24 through 46. 24 through 46. It's a long reading, but you can do it, John. Yeah. 
and happy to do so. Thank you, John. I, right. Another thing, before, before you start, John, all the men of the congregation, I want you to see something. He's standing to read God's Word. That's something that's old school right there. And, John, let me ask you this before we go any further, before you read. Do you remember the days when the men got down on one knee to pray? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a sign, I mean, obviously we're in the same generation, but it was a sign of reverence back in the day, wasn't it? Yep. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, John, if you okay. don't mind reading. All right. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will be thrown into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the heaven, in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. That's good right there. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the things I want you to see when he explains this parable is he calls the field the world. Now the other thing I want you to see in all three of these parables together, they all start out with the kingdom of heaven is like. Okay? And the parable of the weeds is one that calls the disciples some problems. But he comes around and he says, look, in this world, there will be both good and bad people. You've got it in your notes. On earth, we will have to live with both good and bad people. It's just the way it is. But I want to take you down a journey through the scriptures to explain this a little bit more. The first group of people that we have to live with in this world are the non-Christians. And how should we react to non-Christians? Well, the first passage I have for you is in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. And it says, I wrote you in my letter. Underline the words, my letter, because a lot of you think that there are uh, just two books to the city of Corinth. It's speculated that there's at least four. And that we have two. God gave us two that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. But he says, in my letter, we call this 1 Corinthians because it's the first Corinthian book that we have. But there had to have been a letter before this. In my letter, 
I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. And then underline these words, not at all, meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. Underline that sentence because that is key to us being in this world. I have a neighbor who I am loving by doing things for him and watching out for him and befriending him. He has almost every night a different girl come over and he drinks heavily. But I am not judging him. I judge what he does but I don't render judgment on him. Do you understand what I'm saying here? I judge what he does because I know what is right and I know what is wrong. But I do not render judgment on him and say, okay, you're never going to make it. And I'm not going to associate with you and I'm not going to befriend you. Do you understand what he's, Paul's saying here? We've got to live in this world. If we can't live in this world with the sinners and the things that's going on in this world, Jesus would have snatched us out. And I think at times I would have been so much better off after the day I was baptized at nine if God had come down and reached his hand down and taken me to heaven. But that was not his plan for me. He had a, a plan for me to sanctify me while I'm living in this world. And it goes on to say, but I know, but now... I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer or a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is of mine to judge those outside the church? Underline those words. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? And what he is saying is I know what they're doing is wrong, but I am not rendering judgment on them. He's talking about rendering judgment on people in the church. And he goes on to say, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not judging those inside? God will judge those outside. Underline those words, because that's significant. God will judge those outside. For centuries, Christians have tried to help God out by judging people on earth that are outside the church. For centuries, they have done that. We've done it through witch trials. We've done it through the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, right now, there is problems in England that has gone on for years and years between the Catholic and Protestants. And, you know, Jesus says... You'll know they're Christians by their love for each other. They've got war going on over there. And there's a lot of turmoil going on underneath between the Protestants and Christians there. And what he's saying here is you can judge those who are outside of the church, or you can judge those inside the church, but not outside the church. And it says, expel the wicked person from among you. Now, this next scripture here I want you to see because this is what we are to do. This is how we are to live among the weeds. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which weigh war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We are to live such good lives among the pagans that they are going to see our good deeds and glorify God on the day of judgment. Now, there are some people that feel like, you know, I have to have a Christian mechanic, I have to have a Christian plumber, I have to have a Christian carpet layer, and I want to surround myself with Christians. As a matter of fact, I know a preacher, I love him to death, but he was preaching in Texas, and he got a group of people that were very wealthy, and they bought land up in Tennessee. This group of people, they were all fairly young, they bought land up in Tennessee, and at one particular moment, he took 
I think it was probably about 20 people from the church in Texas, and they all moved to Tennessee to live in a compound together so they wouldn't have to deal with non-Christians. Most bizarre thing that I've ever seen. We are to be in the world, not of the world. But a lot of us have used our Christian learning and our Christian knowledge to try to distance ourselves from everybody in the world. All right. Second Timothy. Oh, and I want, a, a, although they accuse you of doing wrong, I want you to put beside that no one ever kicks a dead dog. I'm going to tell every church leader that I've ever come in contact with them when they complain to me about, well, I'm trying to do this, but this person's complaining, and this person said this about me, and this thing happened here, and I tell them all the time, nobody ever kicks a dead dog. As long as you're trying to do something good, you are going to be accused of doing something wrong. It's just the price you pay for leadership. If no one is accusing you of doing anything wrong, then you're not doing anything. And it's just the price of being a leader. And it's not easy because most of us would rather have people like us than have disdain for us. But as long as we're doing good on the day of judgment, they will give glory to God. Uh, first, or 2 Timothy 2, 4 through 6, As the Lord's servant, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. I underline those words because I have met enough Christians that have been baptized by vinegar that I am about ready to explode. We have people in the church, and it's not just this church, it is every church I have ever been a part of that are quarrelsome. And we will call them down occasionally. But I'm going to tell you this. This scripture right here, the people who are quarrelsome, they don't read this scripture and look at their life because they don't think they're quarrelsome. And it can only be fixed in a very loving and kind situation because a quarrelsome person is always going to be quarrelsome until you point it out to them. But you've got to do it in a loving and kind manner. I've witnessed our elders do this magnificently. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. <sighs> yes, Chris, over here, that way. <laughs> well, we do have another Chris. Yes, I know. It may not, it may get us off track a little bit, but uh, back on 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13, I just found it um, extremely interesting that in the last 10 years in particular, it seems to me that, you know, I must have heard at least 100 times, are you judging me? You know, you're not judging me or I'm not, and I've seen people that say, well, they're doing something wrong, one of our brothers and sisters, but I'm not his judge, only, only God is. So but, you're, you're talking about biblical tolerance not secular tolerance. Biblical tolerance says basically you have the right to be wrong. I'm telling you what the Bible says and you have a right to obey it or not. That's biblical tolerance. Secular tolerance is you can't tell me I'm wrong. But I'm, I'm referring more to the fact that, that back in 1 Corinthians 5, um, there at the, at the end of what we read, it clearly says you're not supposed to judge those outside. Right. But you're supposed to judge each other. Right. Now, not in a harsh way and not in an unloving way. You're supposed to, to the point that you don't even eat with the people if they're doing these bad things and they're proclaiming to be a Christian. 
Right. I think today in Christendom, you'd be considered mean-spirited and harsh, and I even think it wouldn't fit in what we just said about, you know, kind to everyone. You know, you're supposed to be tough love sometimes to get people to, to, to straighten up. It says that, but I don't think in our modern day definition that would be considered kind to, to refuse to eat with a brother or a sister because they're sinning. Well, and we're going to get to blatant sin in just a minute, but that's what this whole, pa this whole passage is about. A guy that was having sexual relationships with his father's wife. Now, we don't know whether his father was dead. We don't know the circumstances, but in any case, Paul says this is what the pagans do, and they, they would judge. The pagans would judge you. Why are you letting it happen? And, and in my mind, all I can see is, you know, we're going to just love everybody. And we're going to just accept everybody where they are. We're going to give them lots of grace. And we're going to hope they come around. Bless well, his heart. Yeah, bless his heart. <laughs> and, and that's basically what, what was happening there. But we're going to get to that more in just a minute. Any other comments? All right. Let's go on to uh, Acts chapter 8, 1 through 3. You don't need to look it up. I put it in your notes. That was Paul. In his early days, uh, when he was stoning Stephen. And then you can go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 3 through 16, 13 through 16, and he gives a list of what he was, a blasphemer, and all those things. So, why, the reason why I bring Paul up in this is Paul was a murderer, Paul was a blasphemer, Paul was all the things that we should stay away from if they're in the church. But Paul was accepted by those outside the church, and he became the greatest writer of the New Testament books, as far as the number of words. Second, I guess Luke wrote more words. But my point being is this. He was not condemned. As a matter of fact, Barnabas took him to the other apostles. So what do we do with the non-Christians? We don't avoid and we don't attack. We don't avoid non-Christians and we don't attack. And the reason why I want you to know that is because in this world we have avoided and attacked people that don't look like us, that don't act like us, that don't smell like us. Now, I've been doing this for some time. And my greatest joy is to find a new Christian and watch him try to handle his language around me. He knows I'm the preacher, but he's been saying these words, those wordy dirds that you shouldn't say, for so long that they become a part of his vocabulary. And when he's around me, he tries to correct it. And when he says something wrong or she says something wrong, they wait for me to condemn them, and I don't. They'll say, oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. I've heard it all before. Keep going. I'll, I'll never forget when I was a kid. I, I think I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And my dad had done a Bible study with this lady and her kids, and she had been baptized, and she came to church. She had four kids that were little hellions. I mean, they were climbing the walls. I mean, it took four people just to control one of them. I mean, they were, they were rug rats like you wouldn't believe. And the ladies were trying to take care of the kids. And she had gotten the plates. And they'd gotten plates for the kids. And they set her down at the table. And they got her there. And she got her plate. And then one of the kids knocked her plate right into her lap. And uh, she said a wordy dirt. And I was sitting close enough that I could hear it. It was a great day at church when somebody cusses. <laughs> I was just so excited because I was like, oh man, this is going to be good. And I'll never forget, she went, oh. and one of the elderly ladies came up and patted her on the back and said, it's okay. We'll clean you up. Don't worry about it. And that woman Remain faithful until her death. I say remain faithful. She came back and forth in and out of the church because of her background, but at her death, she was faithful. So, you don't avoid 
non-Christians and you don't attack non-Christians. Now, I know we got some people that are going to Christian colleges here and I think Christian colleges are awesome. That's where I found Nancy. It's a great place to find a spouse. It's a great place to get an education. But I'm going to tell you, I've also had other experiences in Christian education that were not so great. And one of them is, is I watched a lot of kids that were growing up and they were protected. They were in their bubble. They didn't get around anybody and they got out from around their parents for the very first time and they went crazy. And, and you know, that, that could happen to any of us. But one of the things that I notice about non-Christian education is my son got to go to USF, and when he was at USF, guess what he was indoctrinated with? And he'd come home, and he'd say, Dad, I don't really understand why you hate gay people. And I said, son, why do you think I hate gay people? Well, you're a Christian, and know what, what Christians do? Well, no, son, look at the people that I hang out with that are gay. And I started naming people. Of course, he said, well, I didn't know they were gay. And I said, because we don't go around saying, oh, they're gay. <laughs> it's not who we are. But we struggled with that. Because you get indoctrinated at a school and you hear it. So no matter where you go to school, you're going to have those things. But I want to tell you that Christian education alone is not going to keep your kid in being a Christian. It's just not. I've seen a lot of people that I went to college with that are no longer anywhere associated with any kind of church. So, you can't avoid it, and you can't attack it. Now, what do we do with Christians who have theological blind spots? And these are the people that maybe see things differently than you. Now, a theological blind spot is not denying the Holy Spirit, okay? Um... Let me think of a good theological blind spot that may very well be. Uh, okay, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. Uh, for years, I was in the practice of on Sunday night, we, we, this is how I grew up, on Sunday night we served the Lord's Supper to anyone who could not be there. Okay? That was our practice, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that practice. But when you look at the Scriptures... And you look at it closely, and, and I'm one of those people that I want to look at it. I, I could have made a great Pharisee, don't you think? <laughs> I mean, I love God's Word, and I can pick it down, and I can make some, some good points. And I remember talking with some elders, and I said, look, you know, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at the Lord's Supper being served on Sunday night, and what we do is we either take them all down front, and we have them do communion in front of all of us. And it says when we come together... We should do it together, right? So shouldn't we all be doing it on Sunday night? Well, we don't have enough communion supplies for that, Neil. <laughs> and, and I said, well, what about, what about the fact that's why we came together on Sunday morning if they couldn't be there? I mean, you know, it's obviously things happen. Are they going to go to hell because they didn't partake of communion on Sunday morning? Ooh. And this idea that was given down to me for many, many years, all of a sudden, I didn't agree with. I don't think that the purpose of communion is something that we just do, whether it's in our home, by ourselves. I mean, we did the shut-ins and things like that, which, I mean, if that's what somebody wants to do, that's fine. But I think the purpose of communion is... For us to be together in one time, one place, doing it together, showing unity and discerning the Lord's body. So that's a theological blind spot. Now, what am I going to do with that? I've never told an eldership, I'm not going to preach for you if you do the Lord's Supper on Sunday evening. I've never said that. I just don't think it's what is intended by that scripture. And you can argue with me and write me letters later. But that's just my first theological blind spot. Now, there is, a, there is another uh, friend of mine who attends here now. He went to a church that was a one-cupper. And he did it for most of his life. And he started coming here, and he thought I had a theological blind spot because we're not one-cuppers. 
And he studied it, and he looked into it, and it was very fascinating to watch his eyes get open, and now he's okay with it. But the reason why I say that is because how many of us in here think differently about something we used to think about? I mean, you just think about it for a few minutes. Some, I, I remember my mom and dad were so upset when I moved to Florida, and they found out the church group was going water skiing together. And my mom says, well, isn't that mixed bathing? And I said, Mom, nobody brought soap. <laughs> it's okay. But, y yes, Jen. It's amazing how bad the sin of mixed bathing became the farther away from water you got. Exactly, exactly. The further away from water you got. Yes, Richard. Uh, I've told people for years that if you haven't changed your mind about a major Bible topic ever in your lifetime, you probably don't really believe. You just have decided you're going to follow this established right. set of practices. Right. That's, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yes, Jack. Talking about blind spots, uh, something as wonderful as what happened on Sunday this past week with the baby dedication. Uh, <laughs> It's for not those, a baby dedication, Jack. It's for, a Bible presentation. For those of you, for those of you who follow the Facebook, uh, one of the most dedicated Christian friends in my circle, uh, just what's the scriptural reference for that happening? And those kind of things, you know, well, you, you look love, at Sam, love, First Samuel and Second, and and yeah. you go to Luke, you see those things, but. It's just one of those things that happens, right. and you get called out for it. Well, I've gotten called out for not doing an invitation. And I have asked every person that's ever called me out. I've either gotten called out for doing not enough of an invitation or, you know, not doing it the way they thought I, used, I should have done it. You know, I always do some kind of invitation, saying the invitation is yours. But if I don't go through the steps of baptism and all that, I've gotten called out on that. And I ask those people to show me the scriptures that the, at the end of every worship service, we have to have an altar call. And there's no scriptural reference to it whatsoever. So, theological blind spots. How do you handle that? I've got friends who study the word so closely they know when the lord is going to return how many times have we heard this right and every time it gets close they have to study a little bit more because it didn't happen there is a fellow that has made his claim to fame by talking about the end times because everybody's interested everybody wants to know but at the end of the day he cannot tell you when the end times are really going to happen so what do you do with that? 2 John 9 and 10. And I got a call from Joel wanting to know, well, what chapter is it? <laughs> I, I told Joel I was going to call him out on that. <laughs> Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Galatians 1. Oh man, I am out of time again. Shaq, why are you taking up all of my time? Uh, let's go to Galatians 1 because I want to get through this real quick. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you. Uh, just go down to verse 7 and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. And then it says down at, at the very last verse there, 9, let them be under God's curse. So here's what we're going to do. We're not going to platform bad theology. In other words, if I know someone has bad theology, I'm not going to let them teach class. I'm not going to invite them to preach their bad theology. But the other thing is I'm not going to go around heresy hunting which is what you're talking about on Facebook. Somebody, where's the scriptural reference for that? Shackleford? You know, that, that kind of stuff just blows my mind that they're heresy hunting. I had a guy who came to church during Christmas time. I preached a sermon about the, Christ, birth, the birth of Christ in the Christmas season. And it was called The Reason for the Season. 
And he went back to Texas and wrote a six-page document talking about my heresy. Been here once, met me once, six-page document about my heresy, sent it to my father. And when my father got it, I got a copy of it. And I said, Dad, you need to tell this guy, because he's not my brother, that if he wants to talk about Scripture, if he's got a problem with me, he comes to me first and not to my father. And I said, Dad, I hope that you will tell him that. I don't know whether he did or not, but he could tell I was riled up. Another situation. I was asked to speak at the Florida lectures here in Florida, in Lakeland. I agreed to do it. I sent in my paperwork to do it. Had all things set up. And they got an anonymous letter saying that I was friends with Rubel Shelley and I should not be on the docket. That I had invited Rubel Shelley to come speak at another congregation in Jacksonville. Don't go heresy hunting. I am friends with Rubel Shelley, but only, not really friends, but acquaintances. So we, I know him, I've met him, I've talked with him, but if you were to say, uh, you know Neil Farr, he'd probably say, yeah, that name sounds familiar, but I don't know who he is. But anyway, very final thing. Oh, I want you to look, write down in your notes, real, we don't have time, I'm sorry. We're, we're just going to stop right here. I'm going to have to finish this up and start something else next week. There's not enough hours in the day for me to tell you everything I want to tell you. So, thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed the class. Uh, I think I did all right. I had a shingle shot on Monday, and I am feeling so poorly right now. So, I'm not even sure if I should be teaching. Did I say anything wrong? I didn't cuss tonight, did I, Jason? <laughs> a little bit. Came close, I thought, but okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Love you guys. You're dismissed.